Hello, Canada. Happy Friday. Congratulations to everybody. You survived another week of quarantine and self-isolation. So pat on the back for you because I'm not allowed to do it for you. Big day today on the One Soccer Hangout. We're going around the Hangouts, recapping what has been a very, very busy week for One Soccer, having landed and interviewed some pretty high-profile names. Since Monday, we're going to discuss many of those shows in depth, get some reaction from people who you may not have seen in a while. <coughs> Kurt Larson, welcome back to the show. Good to see missed you again. Guys. Yeah, missed you guys. We missed you yeah. too. Sounds like it. Yeah, he needs some and more natural light on you. He needs some more natural light on you. Look at me. I'm not sitting Squinting in front of the sun though, like you are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello as well to Asa and Ollie. Good to have the four of you back. The One Soccer Hangout mainstays. Busy week, guys. What was your favorite moment before we dive into it? Asa, hey, so what was your favorite show of the bunch besides the one you hosted because you're biased? <laughs> oh, there's some really good ones. Uh, I thought uh, Victor Montagliani was one of the most fascinating ones. So I know we had a lot of people tuning into that one. Had some interesting things. We'll go over some of that today. But uh, yeah, if I had to pick one, that was one that stood out for me. Ollie? Uh, I'm going to throw a shout out to Andy, Carm, and Laura because I thought they did a really good job uh, with Meg Linehan unpacking all of the, the equal pay news and, and the lawsuit that obviously failed from the, the U.S. women's national team. So I don't think we're going to talk about that one today because if you want to hear some good analysis of that, their show is, is the place to be. But yeah, that was a good one. Landon. <laughs> I love Candid Landon. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> hey, I you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit you know, when he was left off the 2014 World Cup team, but he did a little media tour after that that was sensational where uh, it's not it's not often that you have players that are still, you know, in, in good stead with their clubs and, and their teams and uh, talking so openly about things. And that's one thing Landon's always, always done is talk openly and smartly. It's very true. And as Ali alluded to, um, great conversation on Wednesday. We'll try and fit it in if we have time, but we have a jam-packed show. We're going to try and keep it to an hour. We'll see how things go. Uh, but also, as in true Friday fashion, make sure you get your questions in the YouTube chat, as well as on social media. Producers Armin and Kyle are on it, and we'll send the best ones through to us. But Asa, you mentioned Victor Montagliani. That was arguably yeah. the highest profile guest we had on this week. President of CONCACAF, vice president of FIFA, and a former president of the CSA. So let's start there. Um, where to begin though? That's the real question. So obviously joining Gareth Wheeler on inside the game Tuesday night, one of the big talking points that came out was how on earth are we going to be able to get world cup qualifying in? It has to be done, but the biggest takeaway for me, and I think that started making, making a lot of the rounds around CONCACAF was that the, qualifying format is going to have to change. That's not mm -hmm. necessarily a surprise, but drastically was sort of the, the, uh, the takeaway I had is from Victor in that one. Ollie, what did you make of that conversation? Yeah, well, I think he's right. Like you, you can't give the 35 countries involved a specific period of time to accumulate enough FIFA points to be either in the top group in the hex or in the lower group. And then that period of time not actually happen because of, of the coronavirus and then just keep the same format, right? There, there's a, a lack of integrity there in, in giving teams an opportunity to catch up or even teams an opportunity to, to lose points if, if they don't perform. Um, the interesting thing now is, is what you do with what will be obviously a compressed schedule um, from whatever point we restart international football. And let's remember that international football will restart later than club football. Uh, and obviously the 2022 World Cup. So it sounded as if uh, Victor Montagliani wants to keep all 35 teams, I believe it is, in contention and in with a chance, um, and then maybe expand the hex and have some way of kind of playing into the hex, uh, an expanded hex. Um, how you do that, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to understand why the change needs to be made, Oliver Platt. Uh, you just attempted to explain why and that teams need a fair chance to accumulate points to push up in the rankings. But I'm not, you know, so sure how fair that process is to begin with when you think about, you know, a bit strange to schedule games against, you know, smaller teams, as many as you can to try and catch up. It's all a bit of a weird process anyway, is it not? Yeah, it was. Um, I don't think it was an ideal process, but it was the one we had, right, because of the introduction of the Nations League and yeah, the, yeah. the 2026 World Cup maybe needing a completely different format as well. So it was kind of a one-off, really. But it could be, I mean, essentially it could be if you're, let's say you're El Salvador and you're 
trying to get games, but no one will play you versus if you're Canada and you're trying to get games and Iceland will play you. The whole process is a bit, bit strange uh, to begin with. So, yeah. um, but at the end of the day, still encouraging to hear uh, Montagliani say that a change need to be, need, needs to be made because I think a change needs to be made. Uh, but it depends on what that change is. Um, you want to see teams involved longer in the World Cup qualifying process because I think it's more entertaining. Mm -hmm. But I also think it's difficult to choose a number of teams to be in that kind of final. So why don't we expand it as much as possible? Maybe go to something similar to what Asia does with its qualifying, where you actually have you know two or three different groups of qualifications going and, and the top one or top two in that group get to advance to either a World Cup or a playoff situation. That's that's what I'd like to see. Maybe maybe you have 10 or 12 teams, you divide them into two groups. And the top team qualifies for the World Cup. The second two place teams play off for the third spot and then go from there. So what would you Except, do with the minnows? Just cut them off? Well, I think you'd, you'd hopefully have some, some kind of qualifying process before that to get to that stage. I don't know how you do that, but that's what Asia does, right? Asia basically has a qualifying group phase to get to a, another group phase, right? Yeah, yeah, that's where you have the issue, though, with uh, getting these games in and when the windows will open for these internationals. Um, I, I'm curious to know uh, whether you think uh, this is a better route for Canada going this way or expanding the hacks and creating, uh, like you said, uh, two groups and uh, if Canada's better off as being one of the top three, I guess it would be, uh, in these two groups. What do you think? Oh, it, it would depend on who's in their group, but you have to think that that, that CONCACAF would seed it in, in some way where you'd probably have Mexico and the United States topping each group, right? So then you got to look at who are the kind of who's in that kind of second group of teams, uh, and you'd have to finish, you know, ahead of a Costa Rica or Honduras or or maybe a Trinidad or a Jamaica. And I think that's a lot that's a, a a lot more achievable situation than the one we've talked about, which is going through twelve to sixteen yeah. games and having to go through all these knockout series just to get to an intercontinental playoff, right? So of course, you know, uh, Victor's, uh, um, you know. Victor is saying that the, the process is going to change is, is excellent for Canada and also excellent for, for, for viewers at home, right? And, and excellent for one soccer, given that, you know, hopefully we'll have all those games airing live. So uh, I think it creates a good business opportunity as well. Yeah. What's interesting to me too, is that some the only few certain things Victor said, first of all, it kind of contradicts itself, but they don't know anything right now because everything is changing with the different levels of government and quarantine. And, and he, kept, he kept going back to the phrase, we have to maintain sporting integrity, which is certainly sort of goes without saying, but at the same time, it makes it a little more complicated when you're considering all of those teams. So mm -hmm. I want to pose this to you. We've heard different rumblings, different leagues across North America talking about playing an, a tournament style game in one particular area. Do you think that CONCACAF could achieve the similar thing where you bring in all of these countries, whether it's to three different groups or however you want to do it, and you have a quarantine style tournament, because otherwise you're going to be quarantining when you get home from a one leg before you can play an away leg and all those measures like that. Maybe. Like, yeah, like, yeah I, I think Kurt has it along the right lines that you want to somehow get to like 10 or 12 teams left, right? And then you can go into some kind of final stage, whether it's one big group or, or two or three groups. The reason um, I divided it into the, the reason I divided it into two or three groups is because I don't think it's possible to play home and away in a 10 or 12 right. team right. situation. It's just too many games, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And, and I think it also makes sense to have that kind of number because if you look at the rankings, like... 10 is Haiti, 11 is Trinidad yeah. and Tobago. And after that, it just falls off a cliff. That's, like you're I was talking, just going to say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the group, right? That's exactly the cutoff. And I think that you get a better represent, representative uh, out of that group uh, when you start including those teams and let them fight for the top three or maybe even four spots and, and figure it out that way. Yeah, so I, I think we're probably going to see something like that as the end of it what obviously as we've said the question is what's the start and how do you whittle down on those that massive number of teams into into that small group right that was certainly one of the biggest talking points the other big one and a talking point that got picked up by the likes of sports illustrate sports illustrate excuse me down south was the idea of a potential Liga mx mls super league but that seems further down the road than the big news the biggest tidbit that he gave gareth was the idea of a revamped and expanded concacaf champions league Kurt, does that excite you of that prospect? Yeah, um, I, I think what excites me is is is, is I, I think the majority of the confederation uh, is with me in my line of thinking that 
uh, Major League Soccer and Liga MX joining forces, uh, if you will, would be really bad for um, soccer in CONCACAF and soccer globally because it could spur on other situations like that around the world. You know, what I would say about CONCACAF is they've shown, you know, they've shown a ton of flexibility to try and make uh, the tournaments it sponsors very um, um, heavily in favor of the MLS and Liga MX sides to showcase those teams, the teams that you know come from the two biggest leagues in the confederation. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I think they've shown goodwill in that way, and 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 the need to for for, for MLS and and Liga MX to to want to create something else, I, I think, is just really out of you know. The, the the desire to have a bigger business really so I, I don't like it um, and and probably that's a, a very Canadian perspective right now given given we're here and MLS uh, fans and, and and media might say something different yeah I I've been thinking a lot about like the Super League idea over the past couple of weeks and we talk about it a lot off air and the the idea of a European Super League I'm completely against and and I think we've you know we know the reasons for that but. I am coming round a little bit more to the idea of smaller leagues, um, whether it be you look at Belgium and Holland, for example, you look at the Balkan countries, Scandinavia, and maybe North America, um, potentially creating regional super leagues of some type. Um, I, I think that is one potential route, and it would have to be done the right way to protect countries like Canada. But I think it is one potential route where you could potentially start to create leagues that can rival the English Premier League La Liga mm-hmm. and create a bit more of a global level playing field. Um, as I say, there, there need to be conditions attached to that. And I, my main condition would be that those leagues are open to promotion and relegation. So, for example, a Canadian Premier League could offer promotion to that North American league. Um, I'm, I'm not totally convinced by the idea, but I, I think there's more to it than than maybe a European Super League, which I agree would be completely terrible for the game. It's a decent shout, but how do you decide who gets to have a Super League and who doesn't, right? I mean, um, you bring up a good point because it's been floated before that, you know, teams in the Caribbean should start something of a yeah. uh, a mass, you know, Caribbean League in order to help them improve to the point where they can compete against the Saprisas and, you know, teams from Honduras, the Olympias, because right now they can't. So I understand what you're saying in that it might make sense for some areas of the globe, but then if you're doing that, then how do you say no to anybody else that wants to do it? Well, yeah, I think ideally if you, if you open yourself to some aspects of it, and I'm talking about if you being UEFA and CONCACAF and so on, then you have a bit more control and oversight over the process, right? So if there is a league that you don't think is for the good of the game, then you you have a bit more control over whether or not that can happen. Right now, my fear is that we're going to get to a point where UEFA say no and CONCACAF say no, and they completely shut the door and refuse to have any part of it. And Liga MX and MLS just kind of, you know, wash their hands of the whole thing and say, well, we'll do it on our own then. And we'll have a closed league and, and that would be bad for for the North American landscape as a whole. So as I say, maybe if those confederations can take a bit more of a leading role in it and keep them open to, to promotion and relegation and to the other leagues further down the pyramid, there's something there that's a bit fairer and, and, and potentially can grow the North American game. Yes, I want to give you a chance to get a take in yeah. on the Super League idea, yeah. but for the sake of moving the show along and Armin's heart, which I think is probably failing by the minute here, <laughs> I'm curious to hear more about the expanded CONCACAF Champions League if you want to take the conversation there. Yeah, the, the, I was just going to say that. I think that was Victor's point, right, is that uh, it takes away. Having the Super League takes away from the CONCACAF Champions League, and he feels like that is growing. So, uh, yeah, the big reveal here was that uh, they would have an expanded CONCACAF Champions League. And I think that's encouraging. It helps solve potentially the problem where um, TFC or a Canadian MLS team um, essentially qualifies through MLS but is uh, forced to um, qualify through uh, the Canadian Championship instead. So uh, the expansion there could allow more Canadian teams getting into the CONCACAF Champions League. And I think that's uh, that would be encouraging, obviously. And lastly, on the Montegliani chat, before we move on to one of our other guests this week, an interesting question was posed by Gareth about what the president thought his biggest legacy would be when he left CONCACAF. And there's a lot to choose from. Obviously, 2026, United 2026 coming up, uh, the FIFA Women's World Cup. But what surprised some people was that he said that he believed the CPL 
would be his biggest and lasting legacy. Asa, do you agree with that? And do you did that was, surprise you a little bit? Yeah, I was a little surprised um, because I feel like 2026 in that World Cup uh, would be the most important thing because I think you get the CPL because of that, and that becomes the goal. You get Canada potentially, uh, presumably, uh, in that World Cup, and that's the first time Canada will be in the World Cup since uh, 2026 if they don't qualify for 2022, or since 86, rather, if they don't get in 22. Um, so I feel like, uh, yeah, the 2026 World Cup will be the big one. It uh, can really push Canadian soccer forward uh, with you know Canada being one of the host countries. So I was a little bit surprised to hear him say the CPL, but I, I mean, at the end of the day, this is where you develop your domestic talents as well. So the league uh, plays a huge part in it. Um, yeah, that's that's the only surprising thing uh, that, that I took from it, though. I think one of the reasons he probably said the CPL is because although he uh, had been working on trying to get a World Cup to Canada, and and let's not forget, you know, when it, during his time as, as CSA president, Montagliani had a dream of just having Canada host a men's World Cup. Uh, I told him at the time it was far-fetched when Canada landed the world cup, he came back at me and had a laugh at me. And then we kind of said, oh, I guess we were both right a little bit. Um, but in 2015, he was working on the CPL and I think the world cup coming to Canada in 2026 is more of a group effort. Whereas Montagliani, I think really, really helped to spearhead, uh, the creation of the CPL and, 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 you know, maybe some of the business interests behind it. So uh, I remember having conversations with him back then, asking him all kinds of tough questions, and uh, he said uh, it was coming. And uh, four years later, he moved on to CONCACAF, and the league started. So I could see why he says the CPL. Yeah, me too. I, I think, like, I don't want to talk down at all on the 2026 World Cup because it's going to be massive, and it's going to be, you know, a huge moment in Canadian soccer history, obviously, but it is 10 games, right? Like, I, it's not going to necessarily be USA 94 in the sense that, you know, we're, we're, we're having Brazil against Italy in a Canadian city for the final. Um, so it will be huge, but I, I can understand why he may see the CPL in the longer term as, as, as the real one that will, will have the big legacy. Yeah. That's fair. And I think you saw quite a bit of his inner Canadian come out and he's just proud of putting together what should be a fantastic development platform and pipeline for this country moving forward. Okay, moving on to last night's show, Gareth, also on Inside the Game, was joined by American soccer superstar Landon Donovan, who also revealed a little bit about his Canadian background. We'll see if we have time to get to that one. Um, but there was a, a mention as well that – actually, you know, let's start with the Canadian soccer because I think that was one of the, the biggest pieces from that interview that grabbed Canadian soccer fans' attention on social media. Uh, there has to be a, an – an invitation from the Halifax Wanderers to bring Landon Donovan out with the San Diego Loyal now that he's mentioned that, right? Like, they can't let this opportunity pass itself up. I think they've already invited him. Yeah, yeah there's already been some social media. How there did that come from a supporter? No, I think I saw the club account tweet that. Okay. Yeah. Well, then it worked. How yeah, do you can... think that would, How do you think that would go with, like, level of competition? Like, there's so many juicy storylines there. Do we think this is realistic? And obviously, we'd love to see it. But how do you think that would go? There's clubs all over the world that have these kind of partnerships, right? Like uh, they do a preseason friendly every year or something like that. Obviously, there's a bit of a geographic challenge between San Diego and, and Halifax in, in terms of the distance. But yeah, why not? I th think that could be a nice little partnership for, for two up and coming clubs. I had this vision for a while now of uh, trying to send CPL kits to as many, um, you know, interesting either entertainment people or sports you know figureheads and try and get them to sport some of the the canadian you know soccer kits that uh, we think are so impressive so i think it'd be a very good idea for somebody at wanderers to maybe take out some of those old 2019 kits and that haven't been used or haven't been uh, purchased and send one to land and maybe with a hat and, and see if you'll wear one for uh, for some kind of chat and have him promote the league a little bit well, they already had the history there, too, because they met in uh, a Twitter competition. We've been running quite a few on our one soccer, soccer social channels, but I can't remember the exact account. It's something like Fot Mob or Foot Mob um, that did the best logos in foot, footy from around the world. And it was San Diego and Halifax in the final. And I think that San Diego won by like a percentage point, maybe. So they already have that little bit of animosity between the supporters groups. Quality of play, though, USL CPL. Thank you, Ace. I do my research for these shows. <laughs> Do you think that the Wanderers may be able to hold their own against the San Diego Loyal? And I'm sure you're not as big up on that information in the USL as you are the CPL, but from what you know, how do you think that would go on the pitch? 
I haven't yeah. looked at their roster yet, to be honest, but get based on what we saw last year with the Wanderers, uh, who finished near the bottom of the table, faring pretty well against the Ottawa Fury, who actually competed quite well in the USL. Uh, I, I, I think um, I think the leagues were much more comparable than any of us thought they would be last year. So I'm sure the Wanderers would be fine. I'd give the edge to them anyways. Anyone want to disagree with that? No, I just love to see it as an annual preseason friendly between the two clubs. That'd be great. Hey, it's yeah, it's the all new Wanderers this year anyway, so who knows how good they're going to be. It's true. That's very true. Uh, the other thing that Gareth and Landon spoke about yesterday mm-hmm. in pretty good detail was the controversy with Jurgen Klinsmann and the decision mm-hmm. to leave uh, Landon Donovan off the 2014 World Cup roster. And it might be a little bit of sour grapes or there might be something more to it. I'll let the three of you discuss that. But um, Landon, in his defense, was diplomatic and respectful and yeah. gave you the sort of politically correct, I understand the decision, or um, you can't take everyone. But, Kurt, I'll ask you first, as an American, first and foremost, a dual citizen, but as an American, more out of the four of us than anyone else, um, and a journalist- I'm an American, just while. say it, I'm an American, it's okay. Usually you get touchy, I just want to make sure I'm not upsetting you, it's Friday, <laughs> happy moods here. Do you agree with Donovan's uh, sentiments about it? We're at the point now where no one you won't even call me an American. God, how scared how scared are you? I haven't seen you in a while. I don't right, want you to right. come back and just fight with me for an hour. We do that uh, at the meetings. Uh very interesting time in, in, in US soccer when I, I, for, I think it might have been Taylor Twelman. I'm sorry to whoever broke the news at the time, but um reported that Landon Donovan had been cut from the 2014 preliminary World Cup camp. And it was like, it was just, it was, you, for some reason, you weren't that surprised just given the way Jurgen Klinsmann goes about things and the way he forms his squads and the players he has in and the players he leaves off. But at the same time, you were kind of like, I can't believe Jurgen Klinsmann actually left Landon Donovan off of the World Cup team. It was supposed to be Donovan's, what was it, maybe his fifth tournament. Um, It was going to be his, his final World Cup. And for him to be left off, I thought was disgraceful, especially because it seemed like it was a little bit personal. And then you see some of the guys that were on the team and shouldn't have been. And uh, you you see where Donovan's coming from. He gave a lot of honest interviews after that. Um, And um, I'm going to say this, this, this might not make sense given that I was an American fan, but the unfortunate part was that Jurgen Klinsmann could actually walk away from that tournament saying that he made the right decisions because they got to a round of 16 even though they played terribly, in my opinion, they lucked into a round of 16 and then actually took Belgium into extra time, which was just, I, I don't know how they did it. But then he was able to look back at all the decisions he made and say, see, I'm a genius. My roster was the right one, even though it wasn't. And not only that, but Julian Green, who probably took Donovan's spot, got the goal I saw, against I know. Belgium. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. I, I think I wrote a column after that game. I was actually at that Belgium U S game in, in Salvador, Brazil. And I, and I think I wrote a column after it basically saying how Klinsman had made all the wrong decisions. And then of course the U S soccer fans came out be like, well, what are you talking about? We made a round of 16. And I'm like, I can't believe, I can't believe this has happened. Yeah. Um, well, I'd struggle to take too much credit for that. If I was Jürgen Klinsman given, Tim Howard made, I think, a record-breaking number of saves in that yeah. game. Yeah, but it wasn't even that game. It was getting it was getting completely dominated by Ghana in the first game. They played pretty well against Portugal. I'll give them that. But then absolutely played off the park against Germany, somehow advanced. Um, I don't know. Just look at the roster, right? Yeah, yeah, it was interesting to hear Landon talk about being sort of a vocal leader and maybe helping out some of the younger kids at that time, even if it was just you know walking them through situations tactically. I don't even know if he was that type of player. He would have been that type of player at that time. I I couldn't see him being that mentor for some of the younger kids. So maybe that was part of the reason. Maybe he he's a type of player where if you if you're going to bring him in, I think you you play him and he's a he's a part of your squad and you're part of your rotation at least. I can't see him just hanging out for the entire tournament. Well, they played everybody. I think they played everybody on that squad except for Mixed Discord. So I think everybody got into a game. Well, and well, not the second and third string keepers, but every outfield player except for mixed disc route played, I believe. So, yeah, I, I struggle to see why Donovan wouldn't be on that roster ahead of the likes of well, I'd say Green, even though he scored. Um, Brad Davis was another one. 
Uh, yeah, let's let's not forget that Donovan had scored. I, I believe I scored and assisted a goal in the win over Mexico that actually sealed qualifying about eight months yeah. earlier. So to, to suggest he was completely out of form and had been for a long time wasn't really accurate. And it reminded me a bit of, I think it was the 2006 World Cup when England took Theo Walcott when he was 16 or 17. And sometimes managers do that and they want to get the, the next big thing into the squad and expose him. And I just don't think you can really predict with many players at that age, what they're going to be and whether they're actually going to be the next big thing and, and fulfill that potential. You know, maybe there's a few that you can, like like a Wayne Rooney, for example. But yeah. Wal- Walcott went on to be a decent England. Not really. A well, let's say there was a Men's World Cup this year or last year, and Canada decided to leave a team of Hutchinson at home because he, he yeah. wasn't he wasn't in the squad right now. Right? That's it'd be the, it'd be the same thing. We 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 know a team of Hutchinson still through the last few years. Has been playing at the highest level and, and hasn't made teams, and I, I understand that. But at the same time, like the, I think you got to play the guys that are playing at the highest level. Mm. Yeah, that's a great comparison. I think that's a good point. Terrence Boyd, that- Terrence, Terrence Boyd got cut after Donovan. Like Donovan got cut before Terrence Boyd. So needless to say, we all agree with Donovan that some players got left <laughs> off the team that deserved to be there. And with that, we'll move on to Monday, which is when we had Angus McNabb on the show, the new boss of York 9 FC. A very interesting discussion about the future of Y9 and the role of analytics in football and the CPL specifically. Kurt, you also asked him how analytics could make you a better pundit. And he gave you a, a response that maybe caught you off guard, maybe was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, oh. but he said that you could provide evidence for your arguments if you used analytics behind what you were saying uh did you find that as a little bit of a jab at you Curtin? do you want to parry back um yes i do want to parry back um what i would say is i provide evidence for all of my takes and it's the best evidence it's replays from various angles that we talk about before during after games the evidence is right in front of everybody where i'm taking through people through what i'm seeing so the evidence is there right now, obviously, he was talking about longer term things and looking at all kinds of, you know, analytics and support of um, talking about which players have had good seasons and stuff. And I understand that. But in terms of a week to week basis, the evidence is there. It's always there. Yeah, um, I, I think maybe sometimes people forget as well that stuff <laughs> stuff that is said on air, we say li- we literally watch what has happened, watch a few replays, yeah. sit down and then we're on and we have to mm-hmm. say something coherent. Right. And that was something that as someone who hasn't done this before last season was, was certainly a big learning curve for me. So I'm not making excuses or asking for, asking for sympathy, but I think it is probably easier to do a very detailed in depth breakdown after the facts, as opposed to in it during a live broadcast. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so what yeah, are you want to know, if you like... want to know, you want to know about like the number of like line breaking passes from <laughs> Joe Dechara, like it's very difficult to come up with that in like a matter of what, 30 minutes. Right. So, yeah. um, like I said, like they, you know, we, we watch the games, um, we take fans through it, we provide a little bit of entertainment at halftime, we tell them what we're thinking, we, we try and bring a different perspective that maybe they haven't seen during the course of the game. So, um, yeah, it can be difficult at times, but it's, it, the evidence is there always. Hey, so you have a pretty good perspective on this, obviously, as one of our main studio hosts during yeah. the season. So can you either give us one example of a situation last year where there's either a late goal before the half or a result in stoppage time that just completely changed the flow of what you were going to discuss and walk the viewers through a little bit, not too in-depth because of time, but walk the yeah. viewers through a little bit what that's like in the studio when things sort of go crazy last minute. Yeah, trying to pick up on one of these. Um, uh, was it- who got hit in the head in the box, flying elbow? Oh, Boucher. Boucher one, right? So that was yeah. one where, yeah, that it's happens. We should have stopped. Yellow. Exactly. So then that erupts in a massive debate uh, in studio. Uh, what do we do here? How do we change uh, what our focus is going to be? And obviously, uh, goes right to the top of the page. So that's what we focus on. Uh, we're working on yeah, isolating the different angles that we have uh, in studio to to show you the best angles and. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that one, I guess. Uh, so, Kurt's no, that was one where that was you. that was one where Terry was arguing in favor of a red card. I was arguing in favor of a yellow card, and then it turned into basically me like arguing in favor of head injuries, which was not the point. And then, yeah, <laughs> then I was I was like, oh, what have I got myself into here? I thought it was a bit, nah, it's a yellow card for me. So, uh, Julian, <laughs> let's, Julian, let's open that up again. Julian Buescher. To this day, when he talks to me, and we've been going back and forth a little bit, trying to get him on the show. He, to this day, he gives me uh, 
uh, the gears about the about that that night because he uh, he came at me on Twitter, I think, too, right after the game. So that was fun. But uh, who the, was the it? Big... Lucas McNaughton? Lucas McNaughton? I thought. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, incidental. The the big one that stands out for me was the second leg of the finals because we were, it yeah, was even more difficult. Yeah. Goal, yeah, yeah, it was even more difficult because we were on location, so we didn't have all the screens that we normally do. And and then you're trying to judge. Okay, Forge have just won a championship, but should Cavalry have had a penalty and a very difficult to kind of read penalty in in the with, with the last kick of the game? So that one was was tough. Yeah. And you guys both did a great job with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To tie a bow on this one, basically, we concede that analytics have a role in the studio shows and the broadcasts that we do. And as the CPL progresses, should be better opportunities to get those in more in real time. So analytics serve a purpose. We're just finding a way to make it all match. The other thing that we want to discuss coming off of that Angus McNabb show and the discussion of analytics in the CPL is when we do these shows, we just sort of more to pull the curtain back a little bit for the viewers. We do pre-production meetings usually in the morning and then before the show, just to make sure we know what we want to talk about and get everyone situated. Well, middle of our pre-production meeting, producer Kyle's trying to get everyone on the same page. Kurt just hijacks the conversation and goes on a tangent about the eye test 11 versus the analytics 11. And if you were to take your eye test 11 and the best player, the best 11 players by analytics, Kurt's team, in his opinion, would be better. So Kurt, I'll let you take it away and explain your thought process here. Yeah. You set this up very well. Um, so yeah, I, it's I, more of a fun thing than like a me trying to, you know, like a flex, big flex or anything. But um, so I told, I challenged Oliver Platt. I said, all right, we're, we're talking about, this, um, uh, what's, what's resulted from Angus McNabb coming on and talking about analytics and, and, and telling us we need to use more analytics during our broadcasts. And uh, that's fine. But I said, uh, I bet if I pick an 11, just who I think is the best in the CPL, it would be a better 11 than, let's say, an analytics 11 that Angus McNabb would select. And I asked Oliver Platt to choose sides. And Oliver Platt, being reasonable, said he didn't know what he was choosing between because he hadn't seen the players yet. So yeah. that's okay. But I've also asked Oliver Platt to do a little bit of homework. So I'm going to give I'm going to give you guys my eye test, Kurt Larson's eye test, best eleven of the CPL last season. And I want Oliver Platt to kind of give me an Atlantic an analytics based analysis of this eleven. Okay. So we'll start okay. at the back with Carducci. We can all assume that he'd probably be on the analytics eleven too, right, Oliver? Yeah, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but there's a good stat for goalkeepers called, called goals prevented, which kind of flips expected goals and, and rates goalkeeper performance. And Carducci was, by some distance, uh, the best goalkeeper in the league by that metric. So there you go. All right, I'm going with a back three. So I'm, I'm not sure if the analytics would say to go with a back four, um, but I'm going with a back three. So I'm going with uh, Crutzen, Trafford, and Zator. Yeah, like I'm fine with these picks. I I personally am very skeptical of a lot of attempts to measure defenders, particularly when you just count tackles and interceptions. I think that's kind of useless. Header um, clearances too. Clearances, yeah. Um, the one I would throw in there was that when Crutzen and Edgar played together, they kind of wiped the floor with everyone else in terms of the amount of goals that Forge were conceding and their record mm -hmm. through through that second half of the season. So I may have David Edgar in there. but I'll Maybe I could. Okay, I wouldn't disagree with that, but... Again, so the eye test is as good as the analytics 11 here, potentially. Could be. Uh, I'm going with two holding midfielders, although, you know, um, these guys could, could also be kind of box-to-box -box guys. But I'm going with Kyle Becker and Julian Buescher as my two kind of holding midfielders. Yeah. Again, you need some pretty advanced metrics to really rate midfielders and, and deeper lying midfielders. But I would struggle to believe that these two guys wouldn't rate highly. So you're doing well so far. Angus McNabb. I mean, Angus McNabb might have his guy Joe Dechara on there, though. Don't forget. So maybe uh, attacking midfield. I'm going with Tristan Borges. Please tell me there's no analytics that suggest he shouldn't be on my team. There are not. Okay. <laughs> uh, and a front three, which is I think where you probably have the most to say. Uh, I have Ryan Telfer on the left. I have Dominic Malonga kind of as my center forward, but he drifts out to the left a little bit just to combine a little bit. And then I have Nico Pasquati on the right. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say any of these are bad picks. Um, I think the most contentious one is probably Pasquati. I would look at guys like Petrasso, um, maybe didn't play as many minutes, but was more productive in those minutes. So he, he could potentially get in there. I'd also say that 
there's a bit of a debate, right? What's most important in a striker? Is it the ability to get chances or is it the ability to finish? And a lot of analytics inclined people will say it's the former. It's the ability to get chances and that finishing just kind of levels out over time. What if you do both? Or if you do both, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's what Malanga did. He did both. Well, Malanga did not do both because his finishing was not very good. Uh, he underperformed. Yeah, he underperformed his expected goals quite drastically. But he anyway, did. He, he did. But he was also in the Golden Boot race. Yeah, because he could get so many chances. Yeah. So the analytics like Malanga, but they also like Easton Ongaro. Ongaro was yeah. the only player who was really close close to Malanga. So and, um, and, and I don't breath, and I and I don't <laughs> and you know I like Easton Ongaro as a prospect, but this is where we start to kind of veer off in terms of who can pick the better eleven, the eye test eleven or the analytics 11, because nobody has taken Ungaro on their best 11. I I don't know. I, it depends what we're talking about. If we're talking about next season's golden boot race, I, I might put my money on Ungaro. All right. But this is where we just, we want the analytics to support the eye test, right? That's, I think when you're putting together a team, that's how you want to use your analytics. And uh, I think the best quote we had this week on analytics came from the hockey guy, Jim Corsi, when he said that <laughs> analytics is like a lamppost for a drunkard. See, this you is where always... either you can lean on it or you can allow it to illuminate your path. And I think that's how you have to use it. You know, you this is where it always, this is where this conversation for... always goes. This is where this conversation always goes is it always goes back to oh, Larson. He's so anti-analytics and that's not the case. This is where it always goes. No. I'm a leaner. I'm a leaner. <laughs> I don't, I don't think you want to you be a lean leaner. on your eye test. What do you want to be? You want to ha- illuminate, not lean. No, I like leaning on it. <laughs> I don't know if you've got the metaphor though. I don't think what? it's got the metaphor. But is there a case to be made? And I, there's certainly a place for both the eye test and for analytics. They There is a place where they can exist together better. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if this discussion, not that it wasn't thoroughly entertaining, but I wonder if it's a better and more contentious discussion if you're using analytics to compare, say, the best U21 players or the players that aren't already at the top of the league. That's where you can create some separation where players that are doing a lot of positive things, but when you have the analytics to back them up, maybe yeah. once you're, when you get rid of the golden boot and the MVP leaders, that's when you can have the more heated arguments. Yeah, I think there's that. And I, and I think there's also value in them and maybe looking at players who some of their underlying metrics suggested they played quite well, but the goals and the assists don't pop off the page. So maybe you can right. see players who might do better in the future. But I, like, I don't want to speak for Angus here, but I'm, I think I would hazard a guess that he um, brings a lot of kind of the eye test into his own analysis as well, as I think any sensible person would. So I, I don't think there's going to be massive differences between Kurt's team and an analytics inclined team. <laughs> Good place to leave it. We're all laughing and smiling and getting along. So let's move on to our next. Uh, another guest we had, this was on Wednesday. Jason Lutweiler joined us from the UK, backup for Blackburn and in the Canadian men's national team system as a goalkeeper and it was a pretty interesting discussion for a lot of reasons we learned he speaks three languages which isn't that surprising for someone from Switzerland but I just thought that was a cool little tidbit but it was his story on how he came on Canada Soccer's radar we have to give another shout out to Mitchell Tierney of Waking the Red for a blog post now what where Jake or where Mitch's source was for that he's never expected to reveal it but Maybe he didn't have the original scoop, but the point is, Jason will even admit that that's what got him at least the invitation to Canada Soccer Training, a blog post. Is that the most successful and positive outcome from a soccer blog in North American history? All he used to work there. Has yeah. that, does that trump everything you have, you've ever done? Yeah, put, puts my, <laughs> my legacy in the shade somewhat. Um, it's kind of one of the interesting things about working in Canadian soccer, though, right, is that things are maybe you, you can maybe find more things out and you get a bit more access to a, a lot of people and, and so on than you would elsewhere in the world and so even if you're just working on a blog and, and I started with a blog obviously when I moved here um, you can actually do some things that are quite interesting and and you know uncover a few things so this is obviously a great example of that I just love that we were able to bring that to light I was yeah. fascinated because <laughs> I think I mentioned it but we did we all did research on it and uh, that article came up I read it 2015 and then, you know, try to put two and two together. And the fact that he joined Canada in 2016. And I thought it was just interesting that, you know, maybe that this led to him joining Canada and then to hear him say it with us was, was just wild. Yeah. Just flat out. No, that the blog post was what got me to Canada soccer. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Kurt, what was your take? You weren't on the show, but what was your take on it? My take, um, my take is sports blogs can do a lot of good and, and are often uh, undervalued in, in terms of the content they produce relative to legacy media. 
uh, what was it just a few years ago? Uh, what was the blog that came out that, that um, ended up hurting an MBA executive? Uh, that's the kind of work that uh, an online presence can bring. Mm-hmm. Bloggers challenge, find Canada's next dual national. There's a few out there. I think yeah, the what's Canada's think... biggest weakness now? We got to get the bloggers working on that. <laughs> Find a sense well, of searching <laughs> for center backs. There you go, waking the red and co. The other thing is, is they have they have this ability to operate without fear, right? Because oftentimes, when you're let's say at the Toronto Sun, like I used to be, um, you knew there were repercussions for writing certain things about players or about coaches or about GMs. And that was that you might lose your source. You might lose your spot in the press box. You might lose your access. Whereas sports bloggers uh, can take chances and can, can dig a little deeper because um, I don't think they're facing that kind of saying they're not, they're not, they're not coming at it from that kind of same mindset of, you know, maybe I got to see this guy tomorrow because they're operating in on a different level. Yeah, I, I personally think that's valuable as well. Like it, it can be kind of scathing sometimes and it can go too far. But I, you know, some people like to say, like, don't hide behind your Twitter handle or an, an, an anonymous blog. But I actually think there's some kind of critical analysis that's quite important that comes out of those sources. Yeah. yeah definitely agree. All right. One of our last talking points for today, yesterday's show, Asa, you hosted Joe DiChiara and Michael Petrasso along with Ollie and one of, it was a good hangout, especially the fact that Joe was in a car the whole time, which I think is the most interesting <laughs> location for an interview we've had yet on these hangouts. But um, afterwards, Petrasso took a shot at Kurt for not being there saying that you were ducking him. You didn't want to deal, you didn't, you were scared of a fight with Petrasso and DiChiara. Kurt, what say you? Well, they didn't say, they didn't say I was scared of a fight. That's what I said to them. Uh, I said that I'm smart and I choose my battles wisely. And why would I want to subject myself to two players from the same team coming at me in the same way? So basically, I sacrificed Oliver Platt, told him to go on there. Uh, it was a bit, a bit safer space for him, I felt. Why would they come at you? Well, why would they tweet at me that, why wouldn't you come on the show, Kurt? Are you afraid? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I didn't think we were. by that too, though. I thought we had fun. I thought we were having fun with Michael and, and Joe. That was a good chat. <laughs> well, if they, wanna, if, they wanna, if, they, if they want to know the truth, I had a, a much higher level call. Let's just call it that. I had a much higher level call to be on. You're talking about not flexing before, Kurt. That, that, that was a flex. <laughs> exactly what that was. <laughs> I've, only, what was your I've, only, I've only been on, what, like 45 of 48 of these? Like, like... I'm yeah, not allowed I think this to is episode. Things. I think this is episode 36. Plus, you had Tommy and Bobby. So, yeah, there's about 40, and you've uh, made about okay. 36 of them. So you're doing I'll, pretty I'll, well. I'll try and be perfect. Yeah, that there you go. That's the response to Michael Petrasso. Kurt will try his best to be perfect. Hey, so what was your favorite moment of that interview? I mentioned mine being DKR in the car, but what was yours? Uh, Joe loving his wife and supporting her and saying how <laughs> she's, you know, such a big part of his life, and then throwing her under the bus the next minute and saying that he could not quarantine with her. I thought that was, I thought that was pretty interesting. I love you, but at a distance. Yeah. Ali, what about you? Um, mine was probably the 10 minutes or so we spent trying to get Michael Petrasso's webcam working <laughs> with the, uh, the slightly unhelpful Joe DiChiara just chirping him in the background throughout the entire uh, yeah. ordeal. So I think, I think Petrasso's third device eventually yeah, got things I think, going. I think there's a kiss joke in there somewhere. <laughs> Uh, we only had one question come through the producers today from the YouTube chat. It's a very important question too for you. They want to know if you got a haircut. I don't think you did. I think your hair looks similar to the other shows, but I'll let you answer that question. Has Sinead uh, been dusting off her barbering skills? No, did not get a haircut. Um, I combed it a little different today. So there you go. Keep variety, Friday variety. I think okay, the sunlight. Before- I think the sunlight's lightened it up a little bit too, so it's a little bit blonder <laughs> than usual. Okay, just about time to say goodbye. Ace, I'll start with you. Go through the three of you. I want you to give me your favorite moments from the week that we have not been able to discuss yet. (laughs) Asa. (laughs) From from our shows? Yes, from the week. Or something exciting that happened to you in general. I'm not picky. This week, um, yeah, I'm going to bring this one home. Uh, The highlight of the week has been uh, kindergarten Zoom chats, Zoom classes for my five-year-old because, uh, yeah, she's, you know, having a half-hour class every day. Sits proper in front of the computer in front of her, all her friends and classmates and uh, the teacher just throws questions out there and uh, this one since the teacher asked the class uh, what 
is this Sunday. It's a big day this weekend. What's this Sunday? One of the kids goes Easter and my daughter goes like this. Just a, just a dramatic eye roll in front of the class and uh, yeah, had me cracking up. So that's, that's been the highlight for me this week, just the kindergarten Zoom classes. Ollie, quickly, your favorite moment? Um, I will say Canada's own Daniil Henry becoming one of the first footballers to return to the pitch this morning at 6 a.m. in the K-League. I, <laughs> yeah. I did not get up and watch, but that, that was kind of a... I might have to catch the replay on YouTube at some point. I watched the replay. It was all right. Well, obviously, our, our shows are my favorite moment and so on, but yeah, I'll, I'll get a shout <laughs> yeah. for, for Daniil in there. Kurt, last word to you. Things are opening up. That's it. <laughs> It's a good spot to end it. Well, thanks everyone for another fun week. We appreciate you all tuning in. If you missed an episode from this week or any of the One Soccer Hangouts inside the games or happy hours in the past, check them out on our YouTube channel. While you're there, like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, share them with a friend. Happy Mother's Day to everyone on Sunday. All the soccer moms, your big, our biggest supporters, and you do so much for all of us. So happy Mother's Day to you. For Kurt, Ace, and Ollie, I'm Adam Jenkins. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll talk to you on Monday.